Denizens, good day. Today we fire up some crisis and recovery in Afro-Eurasia, and then more crisis and more recovery and then more crisis, but when don't we have that? So what we're looking at here today, so we're going to talk about um, the Black Death a little bit more. Um, just can't get enough. And um, really, you know, once the Mongols are finished and taken out in China and much of Central Asia, uh, or as they disperse into various empires, we're going to talk about the lasting impact of that, which has a major lasting impact. Um, and then we're going to talk about how across Afro-Eurasia, um, how these rulers who come to power by the late 13 into the 1400s, how they tried to consolidate their power. In other words, bring everything together under, well, one person controlling everything. And finally, we'll also talk about uh, Europe becoming um, not so united, uh, but that's going to be more um, uh, us doing talking about that in class. But anyway, game on. So some of the terms we'll take a look at, those will make sense eventually. So what about those Mongols? So what the Mongols did, uh, you know, they destroyed what was some semblance of a political order with the Islamic world. Remember, Islam, uh, going all the way back to the Battle of Talis, had really held control you know, in the 700s, had really taken control of Central Asia uh, all the way up to the outskirts of Western China. But what the Mongols do by the 12 and 1300s is they obliterate that. Uh, so we have more chaos once again. I mean, the Mongols take over Persia, um, you know, Alexander the Great style, 1500 years later. Um, you know, they capture Baghdad in 1258, like the image that we saw. Uh, the end, the Abbasid Caliphate. We're going to see a new caliphate rise. Um, and, you know, take out a lot of Turkish-speaking peoples, but also uh, cause this kind of dispersal of Turkish-speaking peoples. Um, they even capture the Pagan Kingdom uh, down in Burma, a place that we really haven't talked about. But nonetheless... The problem for the Mongols is that they're a little too belligerent and militaristic uh, to have anything long term, you know, and e each of these Mongol leaders, these Khans um, and, you know, leading the Khanates, you know, each of them wanted or had these grandiose ideas of a massive empire, which, of course, means that there's going to be a lot of bickering um, as they each seek their own power. Um, and then on top of that, you have you know, Muslim leaders who have either fallen from power or are rising from power, and they're also bickering and trying to gain power as well. Um, so basically, you know, this is kind of infighting within the Muslim world that had stretched from, you know, uh, northern Africa all the way over in Spain, all the way over to western China, Xinjiang province. Um, as this begins to fall apart, it leaves a vacuum. Uh, basically, this kind of empty space or a void that, of course, needs to be um, filled by someone or will be filled by someone. Um, oh, yeah, and they spread the plague, did the Mongols. And it was pretty bad, uh, so bad that they didn't even call it the plague. They just called it Black Death. And, um, you know, it was spread basically through these trade routes. But, you know, how did people contemplate this? How did people try to understand, you know, what caused this plague? And I think we already know this, but hey, just in case, uh, a lot of people in Europe um, attributed this to God's anger with humankind. People thought that um, because of the sinful nature of humanity, um, you know, in cities where there were, you know, lewd and lascivious activities going on, um, people began to say, hey, we have a lot of sinners around here, and God has had enough of that, so God is trying to wipe out sin. So a lot of people in Europe, you know, basically attributed this to God's anger. Some of them even took it out, you know, unfortunately on, for example, um, Jews who had settled in various towns. Um, but nonetheless, so... On top of that, you know, this caused this kind of uprising against the church itself because the church, the Catholic church, couldn't really do anything to stop this plague. And people had long turned to the church for everything. I mean, the church uh, kept birth records, death records. Uh, it gave out alms or you know, money to the poor. Um, the, the church really was the govern, governing entity of Europe. And obviously, it also was supposed to protect and or save your soul. But we're talking about a church at this time that is, you know, selling things like indulgences, these certificates that um, people could buy uh, that would supposedly give them a, a free ticket to heaven. So uh, the church came to be seen as not only corrupt, but also 
unhelpful uh, with this Black Death spreading across Europe. So you had a lot of different reactions, and we're going to see one of those with the so-called flagellants. Um, when we meet uh, next class, have some actual footage there, uh, some troubling things, uh, but we'll take a look at that. Uh, but just ba basically how different people reacted in different ways. You know, some people tried to repent, like the flagellants. Um, the Red Turban Movement in China, with that Black Death, they thought, you know, the government needs to be overthrown, so we need someone who can protect us. Uh, and other people just said, well, you know what, if this is the end, I will just turn to pleasure and debauchery um, and kind of enjoy this, this end time. So, I mean, people really viewed it, uh, especially in Europe, as the apocalypse, the end of the world. And just a slight dip there in the uh, population. Uh, you can see the population numbers here from the year 1000 to 1700, um, and it ain't pretty. Uh, you can see there from, you know, about the time of the Black Death, 1340s, uh, to 1400, we have a substantial drop in the population, but obviously something happens as we roll into the 14 and 1500s. Uh, Europe begins to slowly, well, as says the rest of the world, sorry, it's not just Europe, begins to um, recover from this Black Death for a few reasons. Um, increases in agriculture, um, the end of the Black Death, as it just kind of dies out, no pun intended. Um, but uh, not only increases in agriculture, but increases in agricultural technologies, being able to grow more stuff. And then especially after 1500, something really, really big is going to go down, the discovery of the new world. And with the discovery of the new world, we're going to have all kinds of new crops that will be introduced to Eurasia, um, potatoes and corn and uh, other crops that they had never seen before. And let me tell you, a potato... You put that thing down anywhere, that thing will grow. So obviously they're going to have more hearty foods, more access to food, which means, yes, more people and people living longer. And nonetheless, you know, overall this Black Death, sadly, I mean, it wiped out one third to one half of the population of Europe, somewhere in there, it's estimated. Um, but, you know, to put that in perspective, um, when the Europeans come to the New World with their diseases, and of course it's not purposeful in terms of spreading disease, but it is... It nonetheless happens, you know, within 50 years of Columbus's journey um, in what is called Mesoamerica, basically just the Americas, that's fine. Um, we're going to see the population decrease from 30 million to 3 million. 90% of the population will be wiped out within about 50 to 60, 70 years. And a big reason is because of lack of resistance to old world diseases. So as the plague wiped out much of Europe in the 1300s, uh, European diseases, especially smallpox, are going to wipe out Native American populations a couple hundred years later. Here you can see the spread of the Black Death. Uh, you can see where the minor outbreaks were. Um, that would be caused by, you know, just not as many people in those areas, uh, you know, further spread out so that the, the plague is not spreading from person to person or, you know, some type of terrain, which is preventing people from coming into contact with each other would account for where you see, quote unquote, minor outbreaks. So some of the dynasties that we see emerge uh, by the 13 and 1400s. Um, the, the big one um, in, in Eurasia really is the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans have been around since really the 1300s, um, but we're going to see them emerge, but especially after 1453 when they take down Constantinople and end the Byzantine Empire. Uh, we're going to see a new empire come to play uh, in Persia, Iran, uh, with the Safavids. Now, these two empires are important to point out because the Ottomans... Islamic, but Sunni Islamic, and the Safavids practice uh, Shiism in Iran, so they're going to be at odds for quite some time as well. And another group that emerges and comes into power by the 14 and 1500s, yes, the Mughals that are Mongols who are Muslim. Mughal, makes sense. And then, um, you know, all these Eurasian dynasties, they, they really hold one major thing in common. They use religion to legitimize their power. In other words, to say that they are legitimate rulers, they use religious faith. In Europe, we're going to see the concept of divine right, that somehow kings have been ordained by God um, to rule over their particular people. But, you know, China's been doing this for quite some time with the mandate of heaven, though these two things... Uh, are slightly different as well, and we'll delve into that too. So how about the Ottomans? 
So the Ottomans, like I said, had been in power. Uh, their their empire had been developed back in the 1300s. A guy named Osman the uh, first, not to be confused with Donny Osman. Never mind. Uh, but in 1453 is really when we see the Ottoman Empire really coming into fruition when they take down the Byzantine Empire with the fall of Constantinople. Um, and what the Ottomans are able to do is very similar to what we've seen other empires do. They create a bureaucracy. Yay, bureaucracy. And, you know, because they are able to organize themselves, they're able to create, you know, strong warrior classes, the Janissaries we'll see. Um, and they'll, they'll be a substantial and powerful empire that's going to stretch all the way across northern Africa uh, at its pinnacle. Uh, and their greatest ruler, Suleiman, or Suleiman the Magnificent, um, is going to rule at the zenith, the apex, the apogee of Ottoman power. Uh, but notice when that is, 1520 to 1566. The Ottoman Empire is going to disappear after World War I, which is after 1918. So if their zenith was in the midst of the 16th century, that tells you something about the next few hundred years. So here you see the Ottoman Empire at its zenith. That would be there in the yeller. Um, when this, this empire you know, consolidates and, and takes out Constantinople, you can see that the Ottomans begin to spread also into southeastern Europe, uh, the area that we call the Balkans, which has you know, long been a um, contentious uh, region. Uh, that's, you know, World War I is going to come out of here, among other things. But nonetheless, um, the Ottoman Empire, you know, when you stretch out this far and wide, you're not just covering land, you're covering people. And the Ottoman Empire is going to have a difficult time trying to hold together these different ethnic, uh, ethno-religious groups um, going across these areas. Uh, and of course, you know, bumping up there against Christendom, um, you know, conflict is inevitable. Uh, and then, of course, to the north, we have a place called Russia uh, developing, uh, especially by the 1400s, really uh, becoming a power under guys like in 1500s, under guys like Ivan the Terrible, uh, which we'll get to um, later on. But nonetheless... The Ottoman Empire, by the time we get into the 17 and 1800s, is going to get a nickname. They're going to call it the Sick Man of Europe. Uh, and <laughs> they're not going to call themselves that. Uh, the Ottomans will be called that by outsiders because they can clearly see that the Ottomans um, aren't going to hang around uh, for too long, that they're in this kind of constant decline. And what's really going to keep the Ottomans around are going to be the Europeans, ironically enough. And we'll talk about that later on this year. But nonetheless, um, how did the Ottoman Empire roll? Pretty cool empire. Um, the Sultan, the leader was known as a Sultan, um, and he was, you know, considered to be this, this powerful warrior, right? This guy who <clears throat> gained power you know, through military glory, uh, even though a lot of them just became lazy and, um, well, lazy. But nonetheless, uh, and of course, this devotion to Islamic beliefs. Um, the um, sultan was considered to be the one closest to Allah, closest to God. So you relied upon the sultan not only to govern, but also to provide this kind of uh, religious foundation to the empire. So very similar to what we saw with China, with Mandate of Heaven, and with Europe, with divine right. And, you know, every good leader needs a nice palace. And uh, it's no different for the Ottomans. They have the Topkapi Palace. Um, and that's not only going to be the sultan's dwelling place where he lives, you know, dwelling, uh, but also, you know, they're going to train bureaucrats there. And it's, you know, this huge symbol of the sultan's power. Uh, so Topkapi Palace is very much like, you know, what we saw with uh, the witch called Forbidden City or even the Daming Palace well before that. Uh, and later on, we'll see like with the Palace of Versailles. Um, but, you know, the, the other thing, too, is that, you know, as the Ottoman Empire expands, you know, it's, it's interesting that they're covering thousands of miles of territory, numerous peoples. Um, but they actually then would have these regional governors, a lot of them uh, Janissaries, which we'll talk about here in a sec as well. But um, they, they actually became rather tolerant of differences amongst their people, uh, probably because they had to if they wanted to hold on to an empire. Um, essentially, you could practice whatever religious faith you wanted in uh, the Ottoman Empire as long as you paid a tax, the Jazah. Here you see some pictures of the Top Copy Palace. Uh, personally, I'd uh, add a red deck and some polyester curtains. But nonetheless, uh, you know, very ornate. Uh, you can see uh, the decor on the inside. We'll take a look at some video clippage on this as well. Nice chandelier. 
And here you see, of course, the High Sophia, uh, which will be converted into a mosque um, under Ottoman rule. Remember the High Sophia um, coming out from um, um, from uh, Justinian all the way back in the uh, 500s when it was you know, the greatest church in all of Christianity. Uh, that will be converted into a mosque today, of course, since the 1930s. It's a museum. It'd be really cool to go there. Oh, and you can watch Rick Steves go there if you watch that little video clip pitch down there. So how do you govern such a big empire? Well, the the main peoples <clears throat> in this Ottoman Empire were the so-called Janissaries. Uh, the Janissaries uh, were conscripts. A conscript means uh, if you're conscripted, you are forced to serve in the military. Now, a lot of these Janissaries actually were kidnapped as children from southeastern Europe. Yes, they were Christian children. They were kidnapped and then indoctrinated with Islam. Um, and most of these kids coming from the Balkans. So, you know, you're kidnapped at 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old and then, you know, converted over into Christianity um, by this uh, Islamic uh, Ottoman Empire. But this draft, which they called the Devshirm, um, you know, uh, forced these, these kids to come and serve. Um, and the Janissaries become fiercely loyal, at least at first, um, to the Ottoman Sultan. Um, and, you know, they become extremely skilled. They are the finest tra uh, trained <clears throat> troops in the, uh, really on the planet uh, by the 1500s, 1600s. Um, and they, they just get it done. Um, and, you know, they're also very distinguishable from the rest of people in Ottoman society or world society for that matter. Uh, very skilled in the use of firearms by the time we have those in the 1500s. Um, we have them before that, but you know what I mean. Uh, very unique uniforms, but they also have, you know, some privileges <clears throat> that greatly distinguish them from other Ottoman troops. We've seen this before. When you start privileging certain people, you know what's going to happen. But nonetheless... Yeah, definitely the best ones, uh, best soldiers on the planet were these Janissaries, and they were the main ones who could spread Ottoman power, Ottoman wealth. Um, the Janissaries were not just soldiers, right? Uh, they could also become bureaucrats. They would govern distant territories in the Ottoman Empire as well. Um, but the problem is, by the time we roll into the 1700s, 18th century, for those of you uh, playing along from the TH side, um, you know, eventually these people want more power. They want more privilege. Um, and eventually they just kind of become their own social class uh, of nobility, basically. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the more the Sultan gives, uh, the more they want. And, you know, eventually by the time we get to the 1800s, you know, the Ottoman Sultans start to figure out, you know what, might not be such a good idea to keep kidnapping these people from, you um, you know, southeastern Europe, why don't we just um, have soldiers more along the lines of, you know, recruiting them uh, like the Europeans are doing. Problem is, you've already opened Pandora's box, and we're actually going to see some major Janissary rebellions by the 1800s. There they are, Janissaries in all their glory. Um, like I said, very, very loyal, um, uh, obedient to the Sultan, uh, at least for, you know, the first couple hundred years. Um, they became the bureaucrats of the empire, the soldiers of the empire. Um, and, you know, they, because they're so loyal to the Sultan, at least at the beginning, you know, they're the ones who are able to make sure, um, or for the Sultan to be able to make sure that he has in distant provinces, loyal followers. Um, the Janissaries themselves, they're, they're pretty fanatical. Um, they would have their own marching bands and their own music. Uh, and a lot of them begin to actually convert to a new brand, a new brand of uh, Islam uh, called Sufism. Uh, Sufism um, really had been around, you could go all the way back to the 11th century. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Sufis didn't call themselves Sufis. They were actually called that by the Europeans, the outsiders. Uh, and Sufi, uh, S-U-F-I, simply means one who wears wool, as in like, bah, wool. Um, and they were actually given this name by outsiders, uh, the Europeans, uh, up on scene, these people who seem to be practicing a different variation of Islam. <clears throat> but nonetheless, uh, some historians actually argue, too, that the Europeans did this kind of maliciously and purposely to create an artificial divide amongst Muslims. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this Sufism, quite a bit different, is this kind of mystical version um, of Islam where, 
you you try to break on through to the other side uh, to reach Allah uh, through a more um, ritualistic practice, but also a um, unconscious kind of um, linkage uh, with God. But within uh, Sufism, one of the practices is the whirling dervish, uh, where these Janissaries or just practitioners of Sufism, they weren't the only ones, um, do this spin around and around and around and around and around and around and around. And around. We'll take a look at it tomorrow, but uh, it's, it's pretty wild. And Sufis too, you know, they're ascetics, right? They don't believe in material wealth, very much like we saw with Taoism um, or Buddhism, for example, um, because they're trying to find this more, as it says, their organic connection with Allah, this more um, spiritual connection uh, that they felt was closer than, you know, owning stuff. Okay, so something else is also going to go down during this time that the people weren't necessarily aware of, or maybe they were that they weren't or weren't that they were, but nonetheless, something that historians have looked back on and called the Little Ice Age. Um, and this Little Ice Age, um, this is only recently, like in the 90s, uh, that we actually demarcated this era where the Earth's temperature, uh, especially the Northern Hemisphere, actually cooled about two degrees. You might say, well, that's not gonna do nothing. Yeah, it will. Over the long term, uh, this will slightly alter things like weather patterns um, and cause major changes uh, in the environment uh, in numerous places across uh, Eurasia and Afro-Eurasia. Um, and this is the so-called Little Ice Age is roughly from, some historians push it back to the 1300s, some say 1400s, to about the mid 19th century CE. So <clears throat> Earth experiencing this two degree cooling um, is gonna have some major issues, uh, you know, uh, for humanity. Um, the, the Thames River in London is gonna freeze. You have French bishops uh, who try to hold prayers to stop the advance of glaciers. Um, so, so things, you know, got a little bit crazy during this era, <clears throat> you know, and historians have often, you know, wondered, you know, why during this few hundred years in human history were things so outlandish and out of control? Why were the crop blights? Why were people at war? Why was there so much peasant unrest? Well, it wasn't just economic, it was also environmental. Um, so, you know, you have a lot of wars and peasant unrest and people fighting over scarce resources. And in part, this is due to this kind of cooling down and lack of food and resources. And overall, you know, collectively, historians call this the general crisis, uh, this this little ice age and, and all the stuff that, <clears throat> you know, all the effects of it in terms of people fighting. Um, and, you know, we, we had record cold winters, you know, during this time uh, and extremes. And, and really, that's the most important part. It's, it's not so much about the cold per se. Right. It's kind of like when people say global warming as opposed to climate change. Right. It's really more like climate change uh, in that it causes extremes one way or the one way or the other extreme hot, extreme cold instead of average temperate conditions. So we're actually going to see the Sahara Desert grow in size. Um, we're going to see, you know, irregular rainfall, uh, which is going to help with that. Um, in various places around the world, severe droughts in China. Uh, and you can, you know, you can link up these changing weather patterns with the collapses of empires. You know, the Ming are going to fall apart by 1644. Is it just a coincidence that the severe drought hit just a few years prior to that? Um, constant warfare in Europe, but what else is new there? Uh, the Mughal Empire is going to fall apart. You go down to the Caribbean, there's going to be a whole bunch more rain. That's going to mean more mosquitoes. Why do mosquitoes exist? I'm still trying to figure that one out, uh, which is going to mean more deaths from malaria, more yellow fever. Uh, 1639, there's a huge drought in Mexico, which means extremely high maize or corn prices uh, and a lack of water. That's going to cause all kinds of conflict, too. And exacerbating all of this, you know, um, you, you have the great dying in the Americas uh, from the Europeans coming in there, which we'll be delving into for uh, the rest of the second half of the school year. Um, you know, people leaving farmland, um, resurgence in plant, plant life, uh, CO2 reducing, the globe cooling down. Um, 1816, uh, interesting. You see people who, you know, were writing in diaries and, and newspapers and everything else, in the, you know, in the middle of the 18-teens, 1816. 
uh, and it was called the year without a summer, uh, Mount Tambora and what is Indonesia uh, erupted. And it's still one of the largest, if not the largest volcanic explosions um, in recorded history. Uh, and this itself may have decreased global temperatures by a degree. I mean, it's simply amazing. Um, and, you know, it, it took about three or four years for temperatures to get back to, to normal or to, to, you know, temperate conditions. Uh, and because of this, you had harvests that failed in places like Ireland and Britain and Germany uh, that caused some of the worst famines uh, of the 19th century. Uh, the potato blight, 1848, in Ireland, which is going to lead people to leave if they can. As a matter of fact, millions will come to the United States. That's why we have a huge Irish population and the Boston Celtics. Uh, in June you know, of that year, uh, there was frost and snow in June in Massachusetts, in New York, in New Jersey, uh, up in Maine. Of course, I've been to Maine. It's always cold there. And the Europeans. We'll be talking about the Europeans more because, um, yeah, they're, they're different. And um, we'll, we'll delve into them next time. Um, but just to give us a little bit of foundation, you know, the, cool, the cooling temperatures really took a major hit on Europe. Um, and this is going to cause famines and all of these things on top of the Black Death that comes in, in the 1300s is going to cause the deaths of millions across Europe, uh, which is definitely going to change their outlook on life and or politics. But anyway, but anyway, the next few slides uh, talk about some common European beliefs at the time. I'll let you read through those uh, for a little bit of fun. Um, and nonetheless, we'll uh, actually fill this, the remainder of this uh, PowerPoint in uh, by hand with classroom discussion. So that finishes up this round of the PowerCast. And that means I'm clocking out. We'll see you next time.